Welcome Dynamics students. We're going to continue in this lecture our discussion of velocity at two different points on a rigid body that's undergoing planar motion. In our previous lecture we defined the velocity at any point on a rigid body in terms of the velocity at another point on the rigid body plus the angular velocity of that rigid body with respect to a fixed reference frame crossed into the radius vector from the known point to the unknown point. So we're going to pick up from that and look at that same relationship. Uh, this VQ equals VP, the known point, Q is the unknown point, plus theta dot in the k hat, planar normal to the plane of motion, crossed into the radius vector from P to Q. We're going to look at that in a little bit different way. And in that, we're going to look at what's parallel and perpendicular. So this is an alternate description of the rigid body motion that we've already gone through. And we're going to, we're going to look at the line connecting them and what's perpendicular and what's parallel. So really, these velocities of these two points, if you, if you look at them, you subtract VQ minus VP, you end up with this expression for, for just the, the angular components on the other side. So really these two velocities differ, the vector velocities differ only by our, our theta dot k hat cross rpq. So we, we know that our rpq is normal, um, excuse me, our theta hat, theta dot k hat or our k hat crossed into our rpq is normal to the line joining p and q. And that's just a, a definition of the cross product. So basically we've, we've, we've got a vector direction from P to Q. We've crossed something into it. The result of that cross product is going to, by definition, be perpendicular to the line PQ. So if we took something else and we dotted it into this entire expression, the portion that we dot into the, our cross product will by definition be zero. So we're going to take our, our standard expression for relative velocity of, of two points, or excuse me, actually that's uh, ill-spoken. The velocity relative to a fixed reference frame of two different points on the same rigid body, we're going to dot a unit vector in the direction from the, the known point the point of known velocity, the point of unknown velocity, so an r hat pq, we're going to dot it into everything. So we're going to end up with the portion of the velocity of point q that's in line with the line connecting p and q is going to equal the portion of the velocity of point p that's parallel in line with the line connecting p and q and nothing else because this term goes to zero because this cross product is by definition perpendicular to PQ and if I dot something parallel to PQ into something that's totally perpendicular to PQ I get zero. So I can look at this relationship in terms of finding the portion of one velocity that's that's parallel to the other and if I can do so then I can feed those expressions back into this entire equation, this whole expression, and back out my angular velocity terms. So this is this is basically doing the same thing that we've done um, using our our unknown point velocity in terms of a known point velocity and, and rigid body rotational velocity, but with a little bit different different twist to it. And it's something that's more amenable to knowing um, our, our vector products in a little bit where we're using more of a, a point coordinate system than maybe a geometric relationship. So we're going to look at the motion of something where the points are moving along a defined, the path that is defined by a known function. So you've got a rod and one end of the rod at B is moving upwards along a parabola defined as y equals x squared over 2 and the x point of that rod is at the vertex of the parabola at the instant of interest. And 
we're we know that the the rod end B is is its uh, the magnitude of its velocity is 0.3 meters per second, and of course its its velocity direction is defined by the tangent to the parabola at that point. We know that the direction of the velocity of A is also tangent to the parabola at that point. Um, but we don't know its magnitude and we don't know the rotational velocity of the rod and so we want to know those two. We are going to define an r from the known point b to the unknown point a and since b is at 2 meter 2 meter a is at 0 0 easy radius vector negative 2 meters i hat minus 2 meters j hat. So again we can we can define our directions of our velocities by the slopes of the curves at given points so we can write an equation for our velocity vector of b as the, the magnitude of the velocity, which is the 0.3 meters per second, times the cosine of 63.4 degrees, which corresponds to a theta of a 2 to 1 uh, rise over run slope, plus sine 63.4 j hat. And we have the entire b velocity vector. Um, we don't have the magnitude of A, but we have the direction of it. So we're going to go ahead and dot a unit vector in the direction of from B to A um, into our, uh, the expression that we do have for velocity vector A and equate that to um, our unit vector, this should be a unit vector, of BA dotted into our, our vector VB, which we do know. So we're, we're doing our unit vector dotting into both cases. So in this case, our, we've got our unit vector length um, of 0 0.707. So we can multiply that by our magnitude of VA. And so we, we get an answer of 0.285 meters per second. We know that's going to be directed into the, the i-hat direction. We took a pause, so we're resuming here. We're going to go back over our, our RBA dotted into our, our vector A. This is going to end up giving us a scalar. Uh, the total magnitude of VA times the um, the RBA unit vector is going to be component in the i hat direction uh, because VA is only in in the i hat direction. So our point seven zero seven is is coming from the fact that we are only taking the i hat portion of VBA. We've skipped a couple of steps here. Otherwise we would definitely need a unit vector equaling 1 <laughs> total magnitude, but we're only taking that i hat component. So we're equating that to our, our unit vector in the BA direction dotted into VB, which we've predetermined as negative 2.85 meters per second. This gives us a magnitude of our VA and we're going to, to direct it in the i hat direction. We're just going to solve for V sub A and it gives us 0 0.403 meters per second. Now we have our full velocity at point A. We have our full velocity at point B from this expression when we insert our 0.3 meters per second. Now all we have to do is subtract them We've already got an expression for our radius vector from B to A, and we can work through the cross product, equate like terms to like terms, and solve for our, our rotational velocity. So um, this section here included a lot of vector algebra steps skipped, but uh, you'll notice there were, were no unit vectors in this line because we were equating a dot product, which gives returns a scalar and we were only taking the portion in the i hat direction because we knew something about um, uh, the fact that v sub a was directed only in the i hat so that might have been a little difficult to follow so spelling that out the rest of it is just back substitution 
So this is this is an equivalent method again. Um, we're just again we're using our, our basic relationship between the velocity of a known point, the velocity of an unknown point, related by uh, the rotational velocity of of the rigid body with respect to a, a reference frame. But if we happen to have a system where it's fairly easy to identify unit vectors and to execute dot products. Um, this makes, uh, simplifies the process, especially if we could maybe automate some of those vector algebra steps. Okay. So moving forward, next topic, and this is, this is kind of a repeat and grounds us with reference to what we've done so far with movement of a center of mass. We can define a type of rigid body motion called translation. And if you've listened to some of my videos on uh, rigid body movement described by motion of the center of mass, you've heard me reference translation and the fact that that type of um, equating of a body center of mass motion to the whole body's motion is really only valid for translation. Well, now we're going to look at translational motion from the perspective of a, of a rigid body. So the definition of translation is angular velocity is zero. So this goes to zero and the velocity at any point Q is equal to the velocity at any point P, which is equal to the velocity at the center of mass. So it's that very fact, that lack of rotational velocity um, that allows us to represent the motion of a rigid body by the motion of its center of mass. So that was one of the, the criteria that was being used back in our, our particle kinetics discussions where we, we equated Euler's law uh, to Newton's second law. So if now we're using rigid bodies in planar motion, we can, we can think back on that and say, aha, if I know that the body is not rotating with respect to an external reference frame, um, then all of the points have the same velocity. Uh, they have the same acceleration. And I, at that point, I can treat the motion of any point as the point of center of mass because it will be literally the same. So the big caveat is no rotation. So this is what's called translational motion only. And uh, one of the examples of that is, is um, is a, a signpost that moves back and forth or it moves on a curved path but if you can always read the letters of the sign and they don't tilt then that that sign is moving in translation it's not rotating so that's an example that to to kind of tell yourself if 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 you can draw a line on a body and the line uh it moves through an angle just like we demonstrated, then it's rotating and, and the assumptions for translational motion, we can't use them. But it will be true for, for a lot of cases and there will be cases where we can separate the translational and rotational components and treat them um, individually. Okay, going from pure translation, now let's, let's go back to, to something that's effectively pure rotation. Let's look at the definition of the instantaneous center of zero velocity. That sounds complicated, but it's really simple. So what if point P uh, is a point in the reference frame and it has zero velocity uh, at some instant? I don't know why. Somebody stepped on it. It's the pivot point. It's always fixed. Um, it's, uh, it's matching velocity with a surface that it's contact, in contact with. There's a whole lot of reasons why we can know automatically without question that a given point at that instant Maybe not all the time, maybe all the time, but at that instant, it has a zero velocity. So we take a look at that. We, we go back to our, the equation we already derived, and we say, okay, V sub P, this point, velocity zero. Get rid of it. Wow. Look at, look at what point Q now depends on. If we look at the velocity of any point Q, it's only going to be related to the body's rotation. Uh, so basically, we can at that point pretend that point P is a pivot point and every other point of the body is just rotating around it. So we've got pure rotation around point P in that instant. 
So the velocity of Q is equal to the cross product of our angular, the body's angular velocity with the, uh, the radius from P to Q from our point, what is now our point of instantaneous zero velocity to anything else. So that says that, um, that effectively our velocity of any point is going to be perpendicular to the radius vector from it back to that instantaneous center velocity of zero velocity. And we'll use that perpendicular relationship to envision a graphical way of leveraging this, which can be pretty useful. So um, something to remember is if we don't have a zero angular velocity, in other words, if we're not in a pure translational situation, there's going to be an instantaneous center of zero velocity somewhere for any given point in the motion. Uh, may not be on the point, but it's somewhere. So as long as you don't have a non-zero, or as long as you have a non-zero theta dot. Okay. Easiest to see example of this is a rolling wheel. So uh, rolling is defined as the bottom point of the wheel in contact with the surface having no difference in velocity with the surface. If it had a different velocity, it would by definition be slipping. So if you're rolling instead of slipping, it's an either or, you can't be doing both, um, then you're the bottom contact point is an instantaneous center of velocity. It's not a fixed rotation point like a merry-go-round, it's not a pivot it's an instantaneous pivot because there's a different point that is at that matched velocity with the surface at any given instant. But at any one instant, whatever points in contact with the surface has no velocity and everything else rotates around it. So if we, if we draw a radius vector from that bottom contact point to point W over here, like at the west, <laughs> and we know that its velocity is going to be perpendicular to that line. The center point, its velocity is going to be perpendicular, which means it's horizontal. It's going straight. So we've now defined a relationship between the center of that wheel and its instantaneous center. And point E is going to be going down. So there's a right angle between the radius vector from I to any point and the velocity vector of that point. That's one of the, the consequences of, of this cross product relationship here. So we can use that perpendicularity uh, to give us another strategy for solving problems that are geometrically amenable to it. So let's use the concept of instantaneous center of velocity to go back and, and solve for two different velocities and and rigid body uh, rotational velocities. Kind of, this is basically another twist on our VQ equals VP plus uh, theta dot r hat cross VPQ. Um, notice we're, we're kind of we're kind of recycling that same relationship and looking at it from different viewpoints that might facilitate problem solving in different scenarios. So we have a crank arm, and I'm gonna. Excuse me, I'm going to change my, my pen color here to something that shows up a little bit better. So the rigid body from, from pivot point O, let's zoom in here a little bit. This figure is drawn really, really small with a, with a very weak hand. So if we go from pivot point O down down at the bottom here, this is a hinge. So here's point O and it's on a surface. We have what's called a crank arm and it's just a rod that attaches from point O to point A. So this is body C and it's got a length um, and, it, and we, we can define the angle that it's making with the horizontal as uh, basically the angle is um, a tan of, of 4 over 3, and that leads us to point A. We're told that it's rotating. Um, it's rotating 10 radians per second clockwise. So C axis turns about the Z, so it's going that way. And then we have a second rigid body R that connects points A and B, and then point B 
connects with a piston that slides horizontally through some kind of slot. So this is, if anyone hasn't noticed, these, these, a lot of these examples seem to be quite related to uh, the motion that we would expect in an internal combustion engine. Uh, some of these were drawn from a book that, that was very, um, very geared <laughs> towards that, pun intended, so you'll see a lot of that. But those same kind of rotational to reciprocating motion scenarios are pretty common to a whole lot of things. You, you don't necessarily have to be uh, designing an internal combustion engine to run into these scenarios. So they're good examples independent of that particular application. So what we're asked for is the velocity of point B. And we're going to get to it by recognizing that point O is an instantaneous center of zero velocity. It's actually a fixed point, so it's always got zero velocity. But eh, if it's got zero velocity all the time, it has zero velocity at the instant shown by definition. So we automatically know the velocity of A by just applying our our angular velocity of the crank arm, I should give this a subscript C, and cross it into the radius from the instantaneous center to A. So we know our, our um, angular velocity of the crank arm, we were given that, that's the 10 radians per second clockwise. So clockwise in this case, given the way we've defined I and J is negative because given, the, given our right hand rule, a positive omega is going to be in the counterclockwise direction. So we have negative 10 radians per second k hat, and we're crossing that into a radius vector from O to A. So that takes us negative 3 inches in the I hat, positive 4 inches in the J hat. Evaluate this expression, we get the velocity of A. So now we have the velocity of a single point on our rigid body R, and we can then use that and our, our normal relationship between two points on a rigid body to determine body R's rotational velocity and to determine the velocity of B. So we already have A that we got from, from the crank arm rigid body. Now we just use that as the known velocity we need rigid body R's rotational velocity and we have from our 13 inches here and and the the geometry here again of the 13 inches and the 4 inches we've got a effectively a large right triangle oops we have a radius vector from A to B so again we just get that from we just get this from the problem geometry. So what what do we know about uh, velocity vector B? It's only got an I hat component. It's not moving in the J hat direction. So that simplifies our, our two equations into unknowns. So we have a magnitude in the I hat direction by inspection. And so we can we can do what we've done in the past, collect terms in the I hat and J hat direction, solve for our rigid body R, the long one, rotational velocity, and then use that to solve for V sub B and get an answer for that. Um, obviously the instantaneous center of rotation of B, it, it's not at A, it's actually somewhere quite remote to the rigid body, uh, well below the, the J hat, uh, well below the, the scale of the figure shown. So it's not important necessarily to know where it is to use the fact that it does exist. And, but in the case of rigid body R, we didn't actually make use of the instantaneous center. We used the instantaneous center to get the velocity of A, and then we just used our standard uh, relationship between two velocity points on a rigid body to get velocity of B. Okay. Now we're going to do one example of using what I call a graphical method for instantaneous centers. Um, not sure how often you'll use this, but it's a little bit useful for envisioning a problem. And um, uh, with the prevalence of CAD, this may be something that you could, could get straight from a CAD drawing if you, were, if you were visualizing positions and velocities with your CAD. 
So in this case, the instant we're looking at is particularly amenable to a graphical solution because everything is at right angles and it's we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of positions and, and velocities that are perpendicular to the coordinate axes. So we've got um, we've got another two part two rigid bodies. We have rigid body B1 or beta 1 from the connecting points O to A and beta 2 connecting point A to B. Uh, point B again is, is a sliding piston that's sliding in a track uh, that has a 4 to 3, uh, four, 4 rise over 3 run in the, the J hat, I hat plane. So our motion is in the, in the IJ plane and counterclockwise rotation is is positive so counterclockwise is positive omega so we're going to use the the what we're asked for we're told that the angular velocity of our of our lower rod is five radians per second and somebody wants to find um, of course the the velocity of of uh, point b so we could just use we could just use our our vq equals vp plus uh, theta dot times RP, uh, cross RPQ twice, uh, once using and solving for the rotational velocity of B1 or, or inputting it, and the other just moving from, if we know velocity of A, uh, we can do a two equations, two unknowns, and solve for both the rotational velocity and of, of rod B2 and the velocity of B. That's always available to us. But we're going to use the fact that the geometry, this right angle geometry with with the, the line from O to A literally being parallel to uh, the J hat direction and AB being parallel to the I hat direction, uh, we're going to use that to kind of simplify uh, our graphical determination of an instantaneous center of rotation for B2. We're not going to mess around um, so much with B1 other than to use that just to get a velocity for A. So we're going to focus on finding where that instantaneous center of zero velocity uh, is for B2, which is the rotation point around which that that uh, rod is rotating. Okay. So we're going to use the concept that the instantaneous center is going to be located at the intersection points of lines that represent um, the velocities of the two points or perpendiculars to the velocities of the two points that connect them. So just like our, our rolling wheel, um, if we've got a velocity at point A and we take a line that's, that's perpendicular to it, and we've got a velocity at point B, and we take a line that's perpendicular to that velocity. Where those perpendiculars meet, that's our, that's our I. So we need a vector expression for the velocity at A and a vector expression for the velocity at B. We're going to find their perpendiculars and we're going to figure out where they cross. So. Uh, this is time for, for line equation algebra, y equals mx plus b 101. So without necessarily knowing what the rotational velocity is at a, we know that because it's kind of in this 12 o'clock position, its, it's velocity is, is in the negative i hat direction. So a line that's perpendicular to its velocity is literally the j hat axis. So it's that line is going to go straight up. We know that the velocity of point B has to be parallel to this groove, which means something that's perpendicular to it, like so, is going to intersect the, the J axis somewhere around here, and our instantaneous center is going to be right there and that's so that's in our instantaneous center of zero velocity which is our center of rotation for our body b2 so we've defined the line one, one of the lines of that's going to intersect as perpendicular to the velocity of a 
So we need to get some kind of equation for this dotted line coming from B, which is perpendicular to the B velocity, and then figure out where does it hit the y-axis, basically. What's its y-intercept? And the y-intercept of the perpendicular to the, uh, to the velocity vector B is going to be the instantaneous center of zero velocity for B2. A lot of graphics there. But it's basically just a bunch of line equations. So if I say the line uh, that is perpendicular to the velocity of A at A, so that's L sub A line perpendicular to velocity of A is literally x equals 0, which is the y-axis. So it's this line. Okay. So line B, which is a line perpendicular to the velocity of point B, uh, we can define a slope as 0.3 meters over negative 0.4, which is just literally you reverse the rise over run and use a negative sign to, to make a, a perpendicular slope. So we have a perpendicular slope of negative 0.75 meters with our the coordinate system we've shown over here. So we can define a line of y equals negative 0.75 meters x plus the y-intercept. We need a point that we know is on the line in order to calculate the y-intercept. Well, we know the coordinates of point B. Point B is on the line. Uh, and from our schematic, uh, we know that point B is 0.5 meters over and 2 meters up from the origin. So we can plug in 0.5 and 0.2. Uh, for a point on the line, we can solve for the y-intercept of 0.575. So basically, we can truck over here and say, okay, our instantaneous center of zero velocity for bar beta 2 is up here at x equals 0 and y equals 0.575. So that's where my instantaneous center is. Now I'm going to throw back from that and say, okay, I'm going to use that, and I'm going to use that to, to find the velocity of B and relate it to the velocity of A. So I know that my velocity uh, of point A is negative some magnitude in the i-hat direction. I know it's, it's moving that way due to the motion of my bar B1. And I know that I can express that in terms of, of the rotation of bar B2 in terms of that instantaneous center. So I can say, all right, I'm going to start at the instantaneous center of B2 and say, all right, I can define the velocity of VA with respect to this instantaneous center as the rotational velocity of B2, that long horizontal bar connecting A and B, cross the radius vector from I to A, this one i to a because now we're up on bar b2 and we're we're looking at the relationship uh, from that standpoint not not down here so that radius vector is a negative of uh, 0.375 so because the instantaneous center was at 0.575 we know that point a is at 0.2 meters from the origin so that means our radius vector from the instantaneous center of zero velocity for body B2, 2.A is down negative 0.375 meters J hat direction. Okay, we're going to cross that um, into whatever our rotational velocity of body 2 is, omega 2. So here's our expression for that. And we're going to use the fact that K hat crossed into our j hat vector gives us negative i hat, but we've got a negative sign here, so we end up just getting a positive expression uh, pointing in the i hat direction. So now we have to go back and invoke our original conditions for v sub a um, in terms of our 10 or our 5 radians per second and our 0.2 meters from 0.0. We, we knew we were going to have to use that somewhere. Uh, so we know that the magnitude of VA is 1 meter per second, and so now we can substitute back in, and we can get our omega 2 as negative 2.67 radians per second. 
The fact that it's a negative sign means it's going in the clockwise direction because we've defined counterclockwise as positive. And with omega 2, we can go back. We can go back to our instantaneous center uh, for beta 2 and say, okay, I got B, I can get B the same way I got A, except I don't need any other information. So I can use this here. I can look at a radius from my instantaneous center back to B. Okay, so B as at 2 meters and it's uh, Y and it's at 0.5 meters X. So the instantaneous center is at 0. So the radius vector from my instantaneous center to point B is going to be 0.5 meters I hat and again negative 0.37 meters J hat. So over 0.5 down 0.375 is this radius and we'll cross our omega 2 our negative 2.67 radians per second k hat into our over 0.5 and down 0.375 radius vector and the result of that cross product is going to give us v sub b we work through the cross product and we get our, our magnitude of V sub B is negative 1.67. We actually get a check with this. You can see that we've got our, our sine theta, cosine theta relationship from the geometry of that, of that groove. We have the, the angle, the 4 to 3 angle of theta back here. So remember now we're defining the, the velocity of B up in this direction. So our cross product really gives us two equations and one's a check. So we can evaluate V sub B using our relationships um, for the I hat or the J hat and we get the same answer in both cases which gives us some confidence. So we can get our V sub A uh, which we really had to use the rotational velocity of body 1 to get V sub A but we, we work the entire problem from the standpoint of that instantaneous center of zero velocity which is the rotation point uh, for our angular velocity of body 2 that connects A and B and we use that concept um, to leverage uh, the ro go from the rotational velocity of body 2 to V sub B. Mm. In this case, would it have been easier to just use our, our uh, VA equals VO um, plus, um, you know, our rotational velocity of body B1 and, and that way and then, and then work forward with a second expression? Maybe um, I threw this problem in just to give you an idea of how an instantaneous center uh, can be remote to a body, but thinking of it as an instantaneous pivot point for this rigid body that's rotating with respect to a fixed reference frame external to it is kind of a good mental exercise for when we get into relative reference frames. And sometimes it's not so easy to remember what's rotating with respect to what. So the idea of calculating the, the literal position of an instantaneous center really gets us thinking about, hey, this is a rigid body and it's rotating literally at this particular instant around this point. And that point can be thought of in terms of, a, of being in a fixed reference frame not attached to either one of these rigid bodies. So worth going through uh, at least just once. Okay. So that, that concludes this particular lecture. We're going to dive into, in the next one, as you can see, angular acceleration. So we're going to take another time derivative and see what happens to our two connected points on our rigid body and what we can do to relate their accelerations. We're going to end up taking a time derivative of our, of our angular velocity. We're going to get an angular acceleration alpha. And then we can move forward applying those. And of course, it's really great to get to the point where we have acceleration because that's our connection point to our applied forces and moments. So velocity is nice. Kinematics are great. But we've, we've got to take that second time derivative um, before we can relate it to forces and moments and, and get that kinetics connection. So stay tuned. <laughs>